Charles Bronson's reputation as a tough guy has been tarnished by accusations of arrogance and violence. One controversial rumor has followed him since his early days, but the truth has remained hidden. In this shocking new documentary, his daughter confirms what we all suspected, that behind Charles Bronson's tough guy persona lies a world of shocking truths. Uh, before we take a look at these revelations, we first need to understand what made Charles the man he was. Charles Bronson had a rough start in life, and that had a big impact on who he became later in life. He was born on November 3, 1921, in Scooptown, a part of Ehrenfeld, Pennsylvania, which was a coal mining town. His real name was Charles Binsky, and he was the 11th child out of 15 born to parents who had come from Lithuania. His dad passed away when he was just 10 years old from a lung disease caused by working in the mines for years. Life wasn't easy for Charles and his family. They struggled a lot, barely making ends meet. Charles experienced poverty firsthand when he was only six years old. His family couldn't even afford new clothes for him, so he had to wear a dress to school that had been handed down from one of his older sisters. Can you imagine that? And fast forward to when he was just 16, Charles found himself toiling away in the coal mines, earning dollar one for every ton of coal he dug up from the ground. It was grueling work that he always looked back on with bitterness. Those six years left him with hands worn from hard labor and scars on his legs and torso that never faded. Spending countless hours in the dark, cramped tunnels took its toll on him, leading to frequent headaches and a fear of tight spaces. I can still smell the coal in my nose, he would often say, reflecting on those challenging times. Then, in 1943, he got called up to serve in the army. But you know how stories can get twisted over time? Well, later on, when he became an actor, people would say he was a tail gunner in World War II. But one clever reporter dug a bit deeper and found out that Mr. Bronson actually trained as a gunner in Arizona and spent his days driving a delivery truck during the war. After the war, Mr. Bronson didn't settle for just one job. He tried his hand at laying bricks, flipping burgers as a short order cook, and even picking onions in New York. Then he went to Atlantic City and rented out beach chairs along the boardwalk. And you know what happened next? Fate intervened when he met some actors on vacation from Philadelphia and persuaded them to let him paint their stage sets. The actors were so impressed that they hired him and even gave him an acting gig. Now, Bronson, who started off painting, discovered something unexpected. He loved acting even more. Back in 1949, he packed his bags and headed to California, where he joined classes at the Pasadena Playhouse to learn the art of acting. There, young Mr. Bronson, just 27 years old, falls for the charms of an 18-year-old aspiring actress named Harriet Tendler. They tied the knot that very year. After some time, he started landing small roles in movies. He played all sorts of characters, tough guys, builders, and even those scrappy fighters you see on screen. But here's the thing, Mr. Bronson didn't quite fit the mold of the typical leading man of his time like the suave Cary Grant types. Nope, he once joked that his voice sounded so funny, he was more like a quarry than a leading man. In his early days in Hollywood, he didn't get much recognition. You might have seen him in films, but he wasn't getting top billing. He went by the name Charles Binsky at first, but in 1954, he starred in a film called Drumbeat alongside Alan Ladd. And that's when he officially became Charles Bronson. Why the name change? Well, during those times, there was a lot of fear about communism led by a man named Senator Joseph R. McCarthy. Mr. Bronson thought it might be wise to drop his Russian-sounding last name considering all the fuss about communism going on. So he became Charles Bronson, a name that would soon be known far and wide in Hollywood. Nevertheless, he wasn't always cast in blockbusters. In fact, one of his early films, Machine Gun Kelly, was shot in just eight days on a shoestring budget in 1958. And you know what? Famed French actor Alain Delon saw it, liked it so much that he invited Mr. Bronson to France. While there, he starred in another film, Adieu l'Ami, which became a smash hit across Europe. Before we take a look at the revelation made by his daughter, let's talk about one of his memorable roles that was closely related to his real life. In 1963, he played Flight Lieutenant Danny Tunnel King Valinsky in a movie called The Great Escape. Danny was an expert at digging tunnels to break free from prisoner of war camps, even though it made him feel claustrophobic. Funny enough, Bronson could relate to Danny because he had his own experiences with claustrophobia. 
You see, during World War II, Bronson served in the military, and he also worked in mines as a child. Both of these experiences left him feeling uneasy in tight spaces. Despite his tough exterior, filming those tunnel scenes must have been quite challenging for him. But guess what else happened during filming of The Great Escape? Bronson fell madly in love with Jill Ireland, an actress who was already married to David McCallum. Bronson even joked with McCallum about marrying his wife, but it turned out to be more than just a joke. He ended up marrying Ireland. Meanwhile, Bronson's first marriage to Harriet was in disarraying. They eventually divorced in 1965. By the time he tied the knot with Ireland in 1968, people knew him well. Even though the scripts for his movies weren't always top-notch, most people agreed that he always brought his A-game to the screen. Fans all over the world were raving about Bronson, but he was particularly popular in Japan, France, and Italy, where he was even given the nickname Il Bruto, meaning the ugly one. Ireland, however, couldn't care less about this moniker. She saw something unique in Bronson, a combination of vulnerability and strength that drew her to him. Even outside of the camera, Bronson had a reputation for being a difficult guy. Some even believed his face betrayed his history of violence and troubled youth. He was known to threaten people and even break a sergeant's jaw when he was younger. He even got into an argument with a director over a scene, leaving the poor guy gasping for air. So it's not surprising that when tough guy Michael Gordon Peterson, better known as Britain's most notorious prison hard man, needed a new name in 1987, he chose Charles Bronson. That name carried some serious weight. Back in the day when Esquire magazine quoted Bronson saying he'd take down anyone who dared to harm his family, it caused quite a fuss. Even Johnny Carson, the famous TV host, couldn't help but ask Bronson about it. Bronson didn't beat around the bush, simply stating, because that's what I said. The press wasn't exactly Bronson's best friend. He found their questions too in-depth for his taste. As for film critics, he didn't much care for them either. He claimed that critics didn't even pay to see the films they panned. In an interview with Bronson, the renowned critic Roger Ebert once noticed an intense look in his eyes, suggesting a violent streak when dealing with those who irritated him. The director of the film they worked on, Nicholas Gessner, had an altercation with Bronson, and Bronson wasn't shy about criticizing Gessner, going so far as to joke about violent off-screen occurrences and delivering a good shake to Gessner. His fierce temper was something that his wife Ireland was aware of, and she even made fun of it on television. Bronson wasn't bashful about his disagreements with directors either. He considered most of them to be full of Hollywood nonsense. His temper tantrums on set were well known, and directors who worked with him often had entertaining anecdotes to tell about their experiences with the tough actor. For example, Telephone director Don Siegel related a hilarious story about Lee Remick, who was afraid Bronson might bite her in a scene. In Hard Times, directed by Walter Hill, Bronson and his wife Ireland portrayed a tough fighter in the era of the Great Depression. Hill recalled that Bronson was in good physical shape for his age, though his stamina was affected by his smoking habit. There was some friction over editing Ireland's scenes, but in the end, the film came out on top. Sean Penn, Bronson's director for The Indian Runner, learned firsthand about Bronson's character preferences. Bronson was afraid his Italian fans would be disappointed if his character died on screen. Billy Crystal had an interesting encounter with Bronson when he sent him the script for City Slickers. Bronson called Crystal angry because his character died in the script. Bronson reminded Crystal that Charles Bronson doesn't die in movies, referring to his famous Death Wish TV series. Did you know about the controversy regarding his Death Wish movies? So there's this director named Michael Winner who thought Charles Bronson was just the right fit for the main character, a guy seeking revenge for his family's tragedy. Bronson had this intense vibe that Winner believed suited the role perfectly. The movie is about a man named Paul Kersey who's a regular architect until something terrible happens to his family. Then he goes all vigilante roaming the streets with his trusty gun looking to settle the score with the bad guys. And get this, one of those guys is played by none other than a young Jeff Goldblum. Now before Bronson took the part, it was turned down by some big names like Clint Eastwood and even Frank Sinatra. Henry Fonda too said no, calling it downright repulsive. 
But when Bronson got asked, he was all in. Bronson, in his usual tough guy style, supposedly said, I'd like to do it. And when Winner asked if he meant the movie, Bronson's response was classic. Nope, I'd like to shoot muggers. Now you might be thinking, was Bronson okay with the controversial theme of the movie? Well, his agent Paul Koner sure didn't think so. He warned Bronson about the risks, fearing the movie might send the wrong message about taking justice into your own hands. But Bronson was firm in his belief that the movie's message was all about the dangers of revenge. He believed that an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind, you see. And that was his motto. Death Wish hit theaters on July 24, 1974. It cost $3.7 million to make, but brought in some serious cash, $22 million at the box office. Can you imagine? Now, Death Wish was based on a book from 1972 by a guy named Brian Garfield. He wasn't too thrilled about how they cast Charles Bronson as the main guy, Kersey. Garfield thought, oh, once you see Bronson, you just know he's going to start shooting up the place. But get this. Garfield originally wanted the movie to be directed by Sidney Lumet with Jack Lemmon in the lead role. Can you picture Jack Lemmon as a vigilante? Well, the director, Michael Winner, wasn't too kind about Garfield's book. He said it only sold three copies and those were probably bought by Garfield's mom. Winner was pretty blunt, saying, Come on, Garfield, did this is a narrative about a man who murders innocent people. It's a little harsh, isn't it? After the first Death Wish movie hit it big, they just couldn't resist making more. Charles Bronson played Kersey not once, not twice, but five times. They kept making sequels in 1974, 1982, 1985, 1987, and finally in 1994. But the author of the original book, Brian Garfield, wasn't too happy about it. He thought they were just showing off Bronson's acting skills, which he didn't think were all that great. He even said the sequels were just vanity showcases for Bronson. Now these movies didn't just fade into the background. They kept stirring up trouble. Remember in 1984 when that guy Bernard Goetz shot four young black men on a New York City train? They called him the Subway Vigilante. Well, when the director of Death Wish, Michael Winner, was asked about it, he made a pretty cring. That's not the most delicate thing to say, is it? And it gets even stranger. In 2015, at one of his rallies, Donald Trump, yes, the former president, began bringing up Death Wish. He was bragging about having a handgun permit and threatened to shoot anyone who attacked him. And get this, the crowd started chanting Bronson's name. Trump went so far as to say that they couldn't make Death Wish today because it was too politically incorrect. In the wake of those Death Wish movies, Bronson finally hung up his vigilante hat in Family of Cops in 1994. But he didn't retire just yet. He made a bunch of TV movies called A Family of Cops. Now, Bronson's characters were always the strong, silent types, weren't they? Tough guys who let their actions do the talking. And that wasn't just a coincidence. Bronson himself preferred to let his deeds speak louder than his words, especially as he gained more influence in the industry. He wasn't one to chat much, and believe it or not, he couldn't even bear to watch his own films. But here's a twist. Imagine being so famous that they make a movie about your life. In 1990, when his dear wife, Jill Ireland, passed away after battling cancer, her memoirs were turned into a film. Jill Clayburgh portrayed Ireland, and Lance Henriksen took on the role of Bronson. Now, you'd think most people would be touched by such a tribute, right? Well, not Bronson. He was downright upset about it. He even talked about taking those filmmakers to court. In this case, Charles Bronson's rough exterior appeared to extend into his real life as well. The truth behind his wild tales, he used to tell wild tales about his past, adding spice to his own legend by making it seem like he was even violent off screen. He would talk about fights and how good he was at throwing knives. But it turns out those stories weren't exactly true. Seems like he was just trying to make himself sound more interesting. He never actually ended up in jail. And people who knew him off screen said he was nothing like the violent characters he played in the movies. Nowadays, people still accuse him of being haughty due to his habits, but there's a fascinating backstory to that. During his lifetime, Bronson had an unusual habit. He never shook hands with anyone. 
Some assumed he was too proud, but the truth is far stranger. He was actually terrified of contracting an illness and avoided handshakes as a precaution. Some even speculate that he may have suffered from obsessive compulsive disorder, but that's just speculation. In addition to his irrational fear of heights, Bronson also suffered from a profound aversion to fire. This phobia greatly affected his daily life. For example, during the 1974 filming of Death Wish, Bronson insisted that the cast and crew stay in hotels with rooms no higher than the second floor. This was all in an effort to ensure that, in the event of a fire, everyone would be able to escape unharmed. It's funny how, despite his tough guy persona on screen, Bronson was actually more sensitive than anyone could have imagined. His hobbies included painting and sculpting, which may come as a surprise to you, but he actually preferred discussing his paintings in interviews rather than his acting. And here's the kicker. He painted under his real name, Bushinsky, to conceal his identity, and guess what? His paintings sold well despite his fame. Now let us tell you a heartwarming story about Bronson and a young Kurt Russell. Russell was just 12 when he acted alongside Bronson in a movie. When he found out it was Bronson's birthday, he decided to surprise him with a remote-controlled airplane. But Bronson's reaction wasn't what Russell expected. He seemed a bit distant at first, but then something wonderful happened. A few months later, on Russell's own birthday, Bronson gave him a top-of-the-line skateboard. And when a security guard tried to stop Russell from using it on the studio lot, Bronson wasn't having it. He marched right up to the studio boss with Russell by his side, declaring, We're both going to be skateboarding around the lot. Now, isn't that a touching example of kindness and friendship? His second wife died eight years ago, but he found love again with a younger actress named Kim Michelle Weeks, and she was at his side right up to the end. He was a guy who felt profoundly and had his share of tragedies. After a series of health problems, including a hip replacement, Bronson chose to retire from acting in 2003 at the age of 81 after battling lung cancer and breathing difficulties. Zuleika Bronson, Tony Bronson, Suzanne Bronson, and Katrina Holden Bronson were all offspring of Charles Bronson. Katrina has come out and said that she is an adoptive daughter, not a biological one, but that doesn't stop her from becoming a famous film director. The amount of money he had is even more intriguing. Bronson was astute with his contracts, so he ended up being worth a lot, about $75 million in today's money, and he owned a wide variety of properties, from mansions to farms. What's touching is that, among all that wealth, the most precious thing he left behind was a painting called Scoop Town, which belonged to Harriet, a deeply held memory of his past. And then, let us know in the comments what you hope to leave behind and what treasures will define your journey. Also, subscribe for more video updates. And until next time, stay tuned. Charles Bronson's story is a reminder that no matter how tough a person may have appeared, there is always room for love and humanity.